I'll do I'll do brief introduction. So I you know, I spent my twenties studying philosophy, and I studied Stoicism um, for about nine years in Durham University and the philosophy of language. I studied ambiguity, and um, strangely, ambiguity and Stoicism have served me well in the political management of healthcare and. Uh, I've done quite a lot of government work. Most recently, I was the Republic of Ireland government advisor during the GFC, which was a very brutal gig. Um, and since about 2013, I've been in the Gold Coast. Uh, and I'm a director of the hospital services, Graham mentioned, but, but I'm employed by Griffith University, uh, which, is where my, uh, which is where my main sort of professional identity is at the moment. Uh, but I'm not a clinician, and never have been. Um, so, is everybody here, has anybody in here not heard of Kaiser Permanente, Canterbury, blah, blah, blah? So I'm taking it the room is kind of with me on the basis of integrated care, is that right? Which is, I'm assuming is kind of why you're here. So we don't need to over-explain the concept of an ageing population with a growing burden of disease. We don't even need to talk about it, do we? So let's move on. And, uh, and some... Oh. Yeah, so you what slide you Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Janine? <laughs> Uh, yes, hello. Hi. Uh, we need a protocol for how you can follow the slideshow because it's not automatic, I understand. So I don't know what to do. Shall I just say click or something? <laughs> no, if you just tell me what slide you're on, it's fine. I'm on the systems of inspiration one now. It's fine. Okay, I'm on the systems of inspiration one and I'll, I'll, I'll say down arrow or something when I move on. Um, Okay, so, so we, we, we hear all the time, don't we, that some places in the world have got this sorted out and are doing really well. What, what I want to talk about today, really, is a little bit of the background on, uh, on integrated care, but not too much. Um, but then I want to talk about what we actually did, because the integrated care is something that's talked about much more, in my view, than it's actually attempted. And uh, it's been a really interesting journey for the last three and a half years, actually having a go at something like scale on a patient-centered holistic rather than disease basis. Because we'll all have either have run or been aware of diabetes projects or respiratory winter wellness projects or heart failure projects. And, and I, want, I, I was very keen a few years ago to really move away from that and say, yeah, but what would the new system look like? And how would we conceptualize that new system? So for example, for the G couple of GPs in the room, I think there's some, there's interesting questions about what does, the, what does a general practice look like when it's attempting to operate as the foundation of a population-based integrated care system? And I th my view is that those differences would be minor but profound because you're still going to have to have a room of 15 to 20 people that you're going to have to see, but the manner in which some of those treatments will happen I think will be different if we were in a deeper collaboration with the other bits of the system. And I think that some of those are really important questions that can only begin to be answered once we have a practical go. And so I want to talk about that and I'll, I'll kind of do it warts and all. Um, I'm moving on now, next slide. Um, it's a very complicated system and, and we've got to be careful not to oversimplify it either. So on the right hand side is broadly speaking the, pro the uh, proxy for um, hospital and, com and community services and the emergency department. The reason I put it like that is really because I, I've become increasingly uh, of the view that it's only really clinical teams that matter. So it's not really hospitals in general practice, it's actually the clinical teams that are operating in those institutions and what are the hearts and minds and cooperative uh, sort of disposition of those groups that really count. So we, it, it, common to most socialised medicine um, systems, we have a, a, a distributed way of general practice, which I think is a great benefit of the systems. It's highly resilient, it's highly uh, con continuity based. And uh, the practice of family medicine, I think from Barbara Starfield onwards, is demonstrably a uh, highly cost effective way of managing risk from a health economics point of view and a very, very high levels of patient satisfaction. And around our GPs, we've got our pharmacies and our local go to services and imaging and various other things, pathology uh, that service the, uh, the needs. We have a population focus. And then we've got aged care facilities, families, patients, uh, and patients and families, of course, um, and uh, non-governmental organisations. We probably 25, maybe 35 years ago, started thinking about hospital without walls and all that kind of thing. How do we move on from institutions? I think there's, there's a left-hand side that says we've got to manage institutions. And then there's a middle bit about the continuum of care, which is about the relationships between institutions. But there's a third thing, which is a whole new logic and information system, which is about risk in populations. 
And one of the really interesting things about English speaking socialized medicine, which is where my passion is, and I'm guessing most of you, is that we don't select. So differently to Kaiser and the various other places, we haven't got a selection mechanism where if you don't live in that postcode or if you don't d postcode or if you don't live in uh, or if you don't have a certain amount of money, then you're not entitled. We've got problems of access and we have problems of communities feeling entitled and being able to access, but there's no formal exclusion. And the system we want to build is going to be open at the bottom. So it's a come all ye, and then it should be that big argument about human right versus uh, commodity. So how do we establish a socialised medicine system without selection, getting the best of what we've got from international experience and translating it into our actual institutions as we find them today? So we can't imagine some ideal world where this is going to start. It's where we are, literally, Wednesday. What, what are we going to do? And, uh, and it's a non-trivial question, I think. It's, it's, it's quite hard. But if we look ahead 10 years, it can't be less complex than that. We've got to have some story about what's in it for me and how might I be affected by whatever it might be for each of those players at least, and, and probably more. This is one of only two jokes. I've moved on the slide, the next slide. Um, I really like this. So if you imagine the blackboard on the left-hand side uh, is the situation that we find ourselves in on a daily basis. And then the, right, the bottom right-hand side might be the dreams of our imagination about how healthcare could be or what politicians promise. And, uh, and then the middle bit is, uh, is where we try and do our change management. But, but, it, but we really need to start developing a causal hypothesis. How, how, how? I think there's a general agreement about the language of the what, but how? And I really think that's the, that's the burning question. And this is the second joke. If you didn't like both of these, that's as, that's as close as you're going to get to a laugh uh, today. Um, we have to operate systems in vivo. You know, this is a, these, are, these are complicated human communities, uh, highly professionalised, and so everything we do is likely to have a, a re will have a reaction of some sort. And so we've got to be not only holistic in terms of patients, but all holistic in terms of the system. And none of that quality improvement stuff is going to help us at all in any of that, because it's all about projects. Damn projects! Okay, but who's thinking about the system as a whole? And how do we begin conceptualising that? And behaving as if we were a part of one, but le learning how to lead and change one. Uh, so populations and healthcare systems, at that level, how do we begin to think about it? Um, so two background things before I get into just describing what we did. I'm, gonna, I'm planning to talk until uh, 3.15. Is that okay? Because we started at 2.15 and I've got, I got loads to say. I've travelled a long way. So, so if you want to leave, I'll go to the bathroom and then not come back. That's fine. But I'm just, I'm just warning you that I'm planning to go for an hour. Um, so I don't think we should do pilots, but I'm not going to read the slide. Other than to say I think pilots and pilot projects are just different in kind to what we need to think about. I think we should just stop them. I think the only thing we should do is proof of concept, such that if we get above the criteria of success, we scale. And so from day one, we should be thinking about scale, because it's just too safe otherwise. And then if we're not thinking about pilots, we've got to get the top of the shot. We've got to get boards and chief executives and directors and then our senior physicians and then our senior nurses and our senior allied health. I don't think we can short circuit this stage. In my experience in the Gold Coast, landing there, you know, with, with, with no networks and no connections, it was fully six to 12 months before we could approach a consensus and that was hard graft. You know, that's the evenings and the weekends and visiting the practices and calling the meetings and getting people together. Um, but I, I don't think we can short circuit that bit because uh, it, it, it's massive. And, and also, we've got a, the, the vision thing isn't just about, um, it's not vague for me. And this is, this, is my, this is a bit of conceptual work. A lot of government documents are aspirational. We should do this. We must do that. We need to do that. Well, we need to do something different for an aging population with a growing burden of disease. We've said nothing. The difference between that, a lot of that also is virtue, virtue signaling as well. It's about, oh, because I've spotted this problem coming and written it up, I'm now exonerated and it's over to you. And I don't, think that, I don't think that's really right. There's a leadership obligation to say, we've got an idea about a desirable future where people feel respected and people feel valued and outcomes improve and one professional team to the next knows what the other's doing and has got the information related to it so we can make informed judgments. But then how are we going to translate that into something so clear 
that we can have an idea about what we've got to do this week to begin moving towards it and bringing it around. And that, for me, is a vision such that we can explain to people what it might look like, we can negotiate what it might mean, and we can take actions today that move us somewhat towards it, even if it's a small step. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this other than to say this is the first of a number of uh, visualisations emphasising the point that I th I'm just going to come out and say it. it's, it's a simple idea. I think general practice should be the foundation of the healthcare system. That's not, it's, that's not just family medicine. I think it should be the foundation of the system. That's a non-sentimental claim. General practice clinical systems are the only place in the entire healthcare system that's got both utilisation, well-being, diagnosis and pharmacy and in a relationship with a multi-professional team that can explain all of that to a patient and family. Now, even that's not great every day, as we know, but it's the only hope we've got of being able to build something that's capable of having surveillance on population risk management. That's a logical claim, not a sentimental one. So uh, we've also got, at the present state of technology, things that need very l intense levels of care. Um, rare cancers and various other things are the obvious case, but a lot, lots of, a lot, a lot of it in patient surgery. Um, so the game for integrated care is in level two in this diagram. How do we move things down uh, the, the uh, complexity level so that we can do things that don't need overnight stays where possible, but also that we can expand the range of community offerings and supports to general practice to enable us to create coherence in the system? And I'll, I'll return to that claim, but that's, become a, that's a design principle for me. And we can argue about whether that's right or wrong. I, I'm just, uh, I'm just, that's one of my uh, basic ideas. I'm moving through the slides now. I'm on reflection framework. Sorry, if I forgot to, I forgot to uh, tell you. Um, and this is an emphasis of that idea, is that I think there might be a fundamental way to conceptualise healthcare at the 10-year horizon, again, thinking of teams as the basic unit, whereby we've got some teams whose bias will always need to be on acute campus for, the, for as long as we can see. But then there are many teams whose bias doesn't need to be on acute campus. And I think we could begin crafting what that might look like using this idea of population risk. So it's neither nor. It's not, it's not just hospital or general practice. It's what would we need to do to answer risk in a population. And again, I'm not talking about vague risk. I'm talking about specific, named, measurable, identified, patient level, patient identified risk. So because I've got 162 X's in this geographical area, my clinic array's got a look like that, which means I've got that kind of roster to support. And that's the kind of thing that I think we should be moving towards, which is why I say 10 years. Um, and, and, and the other fund, general practice based, I, I'm emphasizing that. But then this third bullet point here is about migrating our concept of how to develop services away from clinic to register. And I think that there's a lot, there's worlds of evidence, as you'll all know, that register-based healthcare, proactive, blah, 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 great, improves outcomes. I think it's got a much broader application than we suspect. And again, this is why the GP clinical system is fundamental. Actually, to, sim to simplify, one of the things where my head is at the moment is I think we need to horizontally consolidate general practice clinical systems, not by putting them anywhere else, just by applying a consistent logic, and then, uh, and then partitioning them into a set of registers and then organising all of the other services around those registers. That would be at its most simplest point. I think that gives us a design logic to begin thinking about. Of course, that also helps us to begin to uh, do things like the uh, personalised medicine stuff, so the home-based uh, devices, which are quite expensive. And actually, there's only a narrow set of people who've got an economic case to benefit from those. So you don't want to just chuck them out. Some places have done this, just give everyone an electronic smart weighing scale. Well, for most people, most of the time, it don't make any damn difference, and the measures don't make any damn And these things about, uh, oh, I can take me HbA1c every day. Well, there's no, no um, endocrinologist I know who thinks that's a good idea, uh, even if you could do it non-invasively. You know, so, so there's more we can do than we should, especially if we're, if we're worried about cost-effectiveness as we need to be. And this is the, basically, integrated care is uh, triangular in shape, as we know. This is the Kaiser Triangle, variously known in other ways. First published, I think, although I'm very, very happy for anybody to challenge me on this, uh, I think this is the Ed Wagner chronic care model from about 1995. I think, I think that's the primal scene of this triangle, and presumably this is familiar to everybody in the room. What's really interesting about this left-hand side, well, the, the, left, the chaotic dots on the left-hand side are mine. That's my contribution to the debate. And um, <laughs> what they signify is what we know today about, for, uh, this is Australia, you might have it all sorted out here. Uh, but in Australia, that's about what we know about how many diabetics we've actually got 
in such a way that the information about them is actionable for all the different people in the system who've got to action it in order for us to get the best response even for our existing level of resources. So when I arrived on the Gold Coast September 13, my first question was how many diabetics are there on the Gold Coast? And the answer was, well, we've got this many people who've got metformin and blah, 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 therefore probably. Oh, the second answer was, well, the Australian published prevalence is this on these demographic population profiles and the Gold Coast age profile is this, therefore probably. They were the two answers that I got. Uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, but, but how many diabetics have we got? And he said, yeah, we've got nothing. We just don't know. We just don't know. And we don't know who they are or where they are, what level of risk they are. Not systematically. Great GPs, no. Good GPs, no. But in terms of a systematic understanding of the population risk from our biggest chronic disease in terms of cost and risk, probably. Slightly debatable. Not really. We don't know. We don't know. And we should know. And we need a shared care record. Good. Um, <laughs> this is my general. Uh, this is my general logic. Uh, this I had. Uh, I'm going to name drop now. I had a couple of years at Stanford, which was the happiest time of my life. I got a Harkness Fellowship in 2010, and uh, the the gig was to go and interview physician, nursing, and business leaders from high-performing integrated delivery systems. And this was the output uh, of this for me, is that there's a general form from all of those, which I think we can learn from. So we've got to define our population. Again, we've got some advantages in our advanced economies um, so with socialised medicine. Although even then, about defining the population such that the appropriate people can see the appropriate patient identifiers is a challenge. So it's all right, it's all very well to say if you live in this area or in that DHB or whatever, but then what do we know of the people who live in that area and what should we know and how are we consented to know the right things? I think that's, ten, if we give ourselves 10 years, we can have a go. But if we give ourselves two years, forget it. It's just we're not going to see the results yet because the foundation's going to have to be deep. Anyway, defined populations mapped to primary care. Again, that's another version of the argument. That primary care group leadership terms in shared strategic governance with specialist teams. I don't think that's escapable. Otherwise, how can we do the transfer of technology or the allocation of responsibilities or the model of care or the pathway? Shared governance with specialist teams, and, and it's that complex. There's an issue here that some of you will immediately highlight, which I'm going to defend against before it comes up. It's this complex, then, that over time informs the evolution of hospital and community services. Now, some of you particularly because there's a few nurses in the room. Some of you might go, oh, is that a bit medical model? So, yes, it is, actually, because, and I'm just going to defend this out, out front. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about an unreconstructed go, uh, return to the 1950s. However, the important thing about medics is that they allocate resource and manage risk. And that's a medical legal issue, you know. We can't get away from that. The point being, it isn't that the, the medic's the only important member of the team, but unless we've got medical consensus about appropriateness and responsibility and accountability, I don't think we really stand much chance of moving the centre of the needle in a system. Therefore, let's do the hard yards of building that consensus. That's essentially where we're reduced to, because medics manage risk medical legally and they allocate resources in the clinical decisions. So referrals, scans, tests, prescribing admissions. And if we haven't got specialist teams in that conversation, then we could do all kinds of work in the primary care space. But if the doctors are still admitting at the same rate as they're admitting before, we're not going to notice economically and the cash is still going to have to go there and the wards are still going to be full. So how do we inculcate common responsibility? And this is an issue of, it's a first order issue of leadership. This is, this is hard because we ain't going to we can't wait for some administration to come in offering a constitutional referendum to sweep away 50 years of professional associations, let's be honest, because those influences are going to carry on bearing. But in a place at a point in time, it can start to happen if there's enough common will, probably. And if you think this argument's legitimate so far, there are some significant consequences. Um, I suppose the point I'm making here is I think there's an existential decision. I interviewed Kaiser and Intermountain Healthcare and the Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin, Wisconsin um, Guy Singer, one of the, I can't bring to mind now. Um, but a lot of these places have been at it for 30 or 40 years. And what was interesting is because a lot of people think about incentives, oh, the incentives are against us and we're not reimbursed in the right way and it's too fee for service and it should be blah, blah. 
But a lot of these successful integrated systems have been doing it in spite of a whole load of policy changes in which all of those things have been different at some point. So my logic of change is this, which is if a local clinical leadership group at a point in time wants to make a turn to integration, then it can make any incentive and reimbursement system work. And if it doesn't, then no incentive and reimbursement system is going to make it. So we've got to do that heart and mind thing, I think, because that's where the... Uh, that's where the that's where the crossroads are, will be met. How are we doing? Is this okay? I mean, generally, can you hear me? I left it a long time to ask. <laughs> I, ca I can't say is it interesting because I I don't really want to know because I'm, I'm going <laughs> to. It's the economic problem of sunk costs at this point. Um, or Shakespeare, if you like, we're so steeped in blood that to turn back would be madness. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to carry on. This is a version of the pilot issue. Uh, you can just scatter down to the bottom bracket if you want, which is where the payoff of the argument is. Um, but we can't be doing pilots for like half a nurse practitioner and a quarter of an administrator and a tenth of an analyst. It's just not going to cut it. So I'm th my rule of thumb is, uh, what about 1% of total hospital revenue specifically invested in bridge services? How long would it take to go from here to there? So uh, in the Gold Coast, we're 1.3 billion tertiary public service over about 550,000 lives. So my, my own rule of thumb requires me to get to 13 million. And from a standing start in 2013, if we have a good round next year, because obviously public health is constantly uh, contested, we might, we might get to 0.8% invested. So we might get to 9 million. Just to let you know, honestly, that's where we are at the moment. Uh, so I reckon it'll be another three or four years with a fair wind if we keep getting good results. I think we might get to one and a half percent. So, because um, you've got to prove yourself, right? Right, okay, so that's all the backdrop stuff. I would take questions, but again, I'm not going to, because uh, I want to get on to the end. And that was right, isn't it? So we're not doing questions now. Well, Do you want to pause? Just keep on the phone as well. We thought we didn't know if it might be difficult. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the backdrop, and then I'm going to tell you the story. So if we're going to do it, we should do it now. But we don't have to. What's the mood of the room? Put your hand up if you think we should stop for questions, or put your hand, put your hand up if you think we should stop for questions. Hey! <laughs> Does anybody on the phone think we should stop for questions? <laughs> no, see, they've muted it, so that's okay. <laughs> Quite right, too. So. So patient and family centred, so I'm going to tell you the story now. This is, how we, this is how we took all of that vague stuff and turned it into a scheme. So patient and family centred with general practice as the foundation. I think there's a missing piece in the system, which is that coordination piece for public systems. And I think everyone's got a variant of this, and some of us have done some of this. But I think that systematic at scale concept of a defined population coordinated by a function in deep intimate actually relationships with general practice and capable of influencing the development of specialist teams in hospital and community services an engine if you like and then for this is our this is our story of course so we've got the public uh, hhs the non-governmental sector and the private sector which is the chaos that swirls around patients and families unless we have a go at trying to bring it into some kind of order so features of ours we we wrote out to because obviously General practice is a market sensitive issue. These are, it's, again, maybe different here. I don't know the New Zealand economy well, although I've read quite a lot of policy and OECD type um, papers on it and I've visited Christchurch. But that, that's the, really the sum of my knowledge. Um, but general practice is a low margin, high volume business. And a lot of practices are under increasing stress. The feminization of the workforce, uh, the, the massive in increase in the administrative medical bureaucracy and, uh, and the complexity of what's actually coming in the door. So we, we, uh, we need to be extremely respectful, I think, of the approach to practice, and that itself is an art of leadership uh, to develop that over time. What we actually did was we got about 100, and at, the, at this time we had 168 general practices on the Gold Coast. We wrote to them all and said, is anybody interested? We've done a lot of work up in, until then. We got about 23 indications of response that were interested. We thought we'd end up with seven. That was my kind of, um, I think we might end up with seven if we're lucky. We got 14 and they said, yeah, we, and they're actually to sign up. And I'll talk a bit about what sign up means. Uh, and, that, and they've got 92,000 active patients on their clinical system. So that's the RACGP definition of three visits or more in the last two years. Because obviously the Australian system isn't registered list. 
it's open at the bottom. You can go anywhere for your bulk build uh, uh, clinic appointments. But the active definition is what's generally used, and that's what we've taken. So 92,000 active patients on clinical system, which is about 20% of our Gold Coast population. And this makes this quite a large trial of its type. Um, we did a lot of risk stratification, which I'll talk a bit about. Patient-centric and holistically focused. We have got, uh, I'll talk about uh, exactly uh, what we did. Multidisciplinary teams. We've got a coordination centre, which is actually a physical location in Southport, uh, in the Gold Coast, and an electronic shared care record. Uh, and I'm going to focus quite a bit on the information stuff, because I think that's the lifeblood of what we're trying to do, um, and, and is the inf information. Um, integrated care is a term channeling my old philosophy of language that's both ambiguous and vague, and they're two completely different types of uncertainty. Um, ambiguity is where a word or phrase can have more than one meaning, and vagueness is where a word or phrase isn't precisely defined. So integrated care is both ambiguous and vague for those uh, semanticians in the audience. So we need to clarify it. If we can't uh, measure, if we can't name risks, we don't stand a chance of managing them, and if we can't measure them having named them, we really don't stand much chance of managing them. So how do we name our integrated care strategy in the context of the risks we're trying to manage such that we can then go and measure them? And that's a pretty high bar from where we are, uh, where the standing start. So, so what we said is there's two actually very distinct things. One is the management of hospitalisation risk, and the other is the management of poor outcomes as a result of badly controlled disease, <coughs> when we could have managed the disease better. And I think these are different in kind. And actually, our integrated care program manages them as two fundamentally separate pillars. It's the same team doing both jobs, but we do them and we think about them in different ways. We've got two goals, and, that, and they are our goals, to minimise avoidable hospitalisations and to maximise the effectiveness of our disease management. So are you, are you OK on the phone? Because I'm just kind of tapping through and I keep forgetting. It's all good. OK. Right. So I'm on achieving core goals now. I was ho I'm hoping there's enough verbal cues. Um, so this is, a, this is another version of the Kaiser Triangle. And essentially the idea, again, totally familiar to everyone in the room, which is that the more intense you need, the higher your uh, level of coordination should be on the basis that if we don't coordinate with an increasing intensity, then your utilisation is going to go up and your costs are going to be net higher over time. That's actually a controversial idea, and I think this is, one of the ones, this is one of the ideas we actually have to test. So basically, if I've got my highest risk, either in terms of cost, poor outcomes, or utilisation, I should be designing my programme around those patients and putting differential resource to the coordination of their care. And again, we do that in uh, two different ways. We spend a lot of energy on trying to identify patients in our population that are higher risk of hospitalisation, and then running what we call a holistic assessment process. And secondly, trying to bring together the GP data with all of the other supporting data to try and produce really effective, true prevalence disease risks such that we can say, Mrs. Jones, you've got diabetes and your HbA1c is nine, you've not had a foot check, therefore. And it's getting to the end of that exercise, which is the uh, real challenge. And that's been very, very interesting, and I'll share a bit about that. So. We start on the left-hand side, integrated care, the management programme's population risk management, really. It's got two separate components, hospitalisation. That itself has got a proactive and a reactive component. Sorry about the jargon. So the proactive thing we do about hospitalisation risk management is that we bring all of our data together and try and identify the top of the triangle of people who are likely to be hospitalised in the next 12 months. That was just the stats rule we use. And then we bring those patients into clinic, run a holistic assessment, uh, which is a nurse-led clinic appointment, and then do dynamic risk assessment of that cohort. So that's, that's, one, that's the proactive uh, component. The reactive component is if you actually go into hospital, we're taking that as a signal that you now need your risk uh, profile reviewed. And so we do two or three things there. One is, I'll, I'll show you what we do in terms of the monitoring of this. But we, uh, we have nurse-led phone calls within about 72 hours of discharge for everybody who's discharged in the cohort. And, um, and we have a multidisciplinary team meeting each week at which we've got about 1,500 patients in our cohort uh, that have been identified as being at higher risk where their risk status is adjusted on a weekly basis and their care plans are adjusted as well. And that's taken us quite a long time to develop the actual sort of clinical processes around that. And, uh, and then for the disease programmes, we're in the process now of developing our registers and I'll talk a bit about that, it's quite interesting. When you bring together hospital data and general practice data, we've got this concept of a consolidated register to get a true view of prevalence and risk. And, and that turns out to be more complicated than we'd hoped. 
And then we've got a reactive disease whereby essentially we run an array of respiratory, endocrinology, heart and kidney clinics in the coordination centre for GPs to refer to to get more rapid uh, opinions than they could do from the usual waiting list uh, malarkey. So we've got a dedicated coordination centre. Um, we've got 2.6, I think it is now, or 0.7 medical directors, one who's a GP and one who's a hospitalist, a general physician and a, a medical assessment unit physician, actually. And that kind of symbolises what we're trying to achieve. And again, the process of advertising for that team sends signals out about what we're trying to do. And uh, that's James and Kate, and they're fantastic. And, um, yeah, they're fantastic. And... Uh, and they work together on a daily basis in the coordination centre doing medical supervision. And over time they've developed a, a, a relatively small junior team that rotates through as well. Uh, the Reggies, we've got nursing staff. Uh, the, one of the backbones of our scheme is the concept of nurse navigators who adopt a practice, uh, can work across practices as well, and really get to know the population in that practice. And that's the conduit of the analysis that we do. We become very passionate about combining quantified analysis with clinical judgment and about what that means for the gestalt. And getting clinicians to think about risk rather than events is a fundamental mindset shift, not only for individual practitioners, but for groups and teams. And that's been a really interesting journey. I'm, you can see the pace I'm going. I'm just going to touch these issues. Every one of these you could dive into like a rabbit hole and open up for a whole seminar, right? But I just want to give you the overview. Um, Allied Health, uh, we've got in situ, and then we've got service navigators who are an administrative Senior administrators run a call centre function, do some form of onboarding. That whole holistic assessment process onboarding was a, a, a massive task uh, for this population. We're, we're on the other side of that now, largely. Um, and these are the staff. Um, that, is, that is the smuggest and most ugly executive photograph you could ever imagine. It's fundamentally embarrassing. That was one of those moments where you go into work and somebody goes, it's the annual report and you've got to take your photograph. And like, oh, no. Anyway, so that's what I look like when I look like a jerk. But um, <laughs> luckily today you get the other side and you can triangulate me. So this is, what, this is why uh, there's an interesting question at the end of these slides. This, we started in 2013, discussion starts. So this is the talks about talks. This is about the, every physician group in general practice at some moment as time has people with older statesmen and older stateswoman authority. So people have been there a long time and on and off the committees been burnt out three times, still coming back for more. <laughs> and, um, and, and, we, and you know who they are here, and I had to find out, but everyone knows, because they're the angry ones usually. So uh, <laughs> I'm joking, you all know, you all know. Um, so so there, was a lot of, there was a lot of that went on, and then a lot of time in the hospital at the same time with the specialists, which for me at the time was getting to know people as well, so it was all good. And, um, and then we reached this nice pinnacle, probably around December, January, uh, on this timeline where the specialists were saying, yeah, yeah, integrated care, we've all been thinking about it for ages, it's a great idea, but you'll never get those GPs to agree. And then on the other side, you had the GPs going, yeah, it's a great idea, but them specialists up at the hospital, they'll never agree. That was really good. So then we got them all in the room, and uh, it turned out they all kind of agreed in principle, and that shot one of the big foxes, because then they couldn't use that argument anymore. Um, and, and that gave us a nice basis for conversation. So we set up little panels of relevant people who are interested in the different areas and started to look at the specific diseases and how we might do the overall hospitalisation risk stuff. So blah, blah, blah. Business case completion and approval in the middle of 14. Mobilisation started in October 14. We selected our shared care technology in December 14. We started enrolling patients in March 15. This is all a furious amount of work, by the way. This is like an epic effort, you know. Um, Anyway, and then we, then we started on onboarding. By that we mean identifying and agreeing with the GPs, those patients who they know are at high hospitalisation risk. And that's fundamental. That honours the concept of GPs, the foundation. It's not just saying, let's just say that. It's like saying, well, I'll tell you what we did. I'll, I'll, it doesn't matter. We got to 1,500 patients, which for us was the, our economic evaluation, but partly funded by the Commonwealth. Said you, we've got to have 1,500 patients enrolled for this to have statistical power. So... Um, and then the ICC box is installed, I'll talk a bit about that, December 17. And then we're coming up to the present day where we're doing our uh, register rollouts now uh, and we're aiming to complete our optimisation phase by September. I'm actually optimistic we'll get there. So by the end of September 2017, from a standing start, that was three years, is that three years? Four years, oh God. Um, 
we will have gone from nothing to a new clinical system for this defined population, about 15 practices, and we'll be up and running for the holistic assessment and the disease management stuff. And then we've got enough funding. I'm actually, technically our funding runs out in June, but we didn't mobilise very quickly. These things never do. So we should have enough gas in the tank to get us to be to um, the, One of the conversations I'm having now is to get our chief exec to agree to extend it to at least September, because I want to give it fully 12 months. Some of you might know about these uh, whole system demonstrators in England. It was a big exercise that published about three years ago out of the Nuffield Trust. And one of the big evaluation things about that is do not evaluate integrated care after 12 months. Just don't do it. It's the wrong thing to try and do. And the second interesting learning was don't randomise it. So there was parts of the, there were, there were arms of that particular exercise where there were, it was self-evident that it wasn't working. And everybody knew it wasn't working, but they had to keep on doing it. So everybody left. And they got new staff in doing the same. Oh, it's just rubbish. So randomization will kill this because it's an adaptive change. This is not a technical change. Nobody really knows how to do it. So it's, it's weird. It is, it is weird. That is one of the words I use often thinking about this. So we're going to run it hopefully for at least 12 months, ideally 15 months in its optimized form. And I'll, I'll show you a bit about what that is. And this big question at the end is, are we nearly finished with a five-year strategy? Or are we a third of the way through our 15-year strategy? And that's not just moving the goalposts, that's just an acknowledgement that the successful places internationally make an existential decision to do this kind of thing and then keep doing it until we get good at it. And I think it has to be that kind of thing. Um, not to say, it's not to say that we didn't have to complete return on investment calculations when we did the business case, we did. But the levels of uncertainty that you're dealing with with these kinds of strategies are just, in practical terms, it's off the charts. So, so you have to put the tram lines in from an economic point of view, but you can't hope. The, o the only thing you're going to know at the outset is that you don't know how to do it. You know. Right, some more details. Information systems, general practice and hospital data, right? It's all over the place. Again, you, your mileage may vary. Over here, you might have got all these tapes, but um, not, not so much uh, in the Gold Coast 2013. So. We had to go through a very, very complicated, uh, squinty-eyed, tilt our head sideways bit of work to say, can we produce a assimilated list at patient level that will enable us to have an anonymized view in the middle so that we could preserve everybody's legal obligations, such that we could de-anonymize in the general practice so that we could know patients who are at risk, and de-anonymize for consented patients on the hospital side from those practices so we could do the management. And that had to be what my concept, which I'm talking about tomorrow morning actually, is about very, very high frequency patient level data, which I think is one of the things we've got to get good at. So basically what we actually did is we got a laptop full of identifiable data, three years worth from the hospital service. We got specific permission for a specific officer to leave with the identifiers on the laptop as long as they were back by 4.30, and that's what the law says, only for this reason. We went to one of the general practices, opened it up, and they loaded their identifiers in. We then... Now, we couldn't leave the practice with those identifiers because that would have broken the law. So we then we, we did the record matching. First time, it took us about nine hours. We got quicker, and then we automated it. And then, and then we deleted all of the information off the uh, laptop except for an asterisk that we left behind of those patients that were associated with that practice on the record match. So as we left, there were no identifiers. We took that straight back to the HHS and signed it back in again. And that then enabled us to concatenate the data for practice A with all of the hospital utilisation electronic medical record information. And then the only people who could look at that with identifiers were the doctors. It's the golden corridor. So if we're doing this for medical planning and the GP solicitors agree to that and the GP pr principal agrees to that and our clinical directors agree to that, then that's okay. And so, the, so the, we, had it, we opened up a corridor of privacy because we had to find a way to begin to connect these databases that would enable us to move towards a risk-based system. And it was very complicated, but it was necessarily complicated. And it was, it was you know, that's, that's probably 12 to 15 months work just on that slide, just to get it done on one round of the network. That's just a manual process. But we, and we took extensive legal advice on this and then we published it. So I'll, I'll, the, uh, the uh, references are in the end. Um, but once we'd done that, that then gave us the basis of a new architecture. So we were able to draw up these anonymized Excel sheets, which, which, which the column headings of which were, have we been in hospital, have we been to ED, are we attending any clinics? And then what's the pharmacy, what's the health status, what's the problem list, and how many times have we been to the GP? And then we shared these with the medical directors and the GPs. And then uh, James Finkar, hospitalist, um, developed a, a risk 
score on the base of that that I'll talk about in a minute. And this is what we ended up with as a, this is, this is, the, this is one of the very audacious things that we've done. Having got to where we got to, this is with our GP colleagues, of course, we, we, um, and you can imagine sometimes it's not the GPs, it's the practice managers, uh, over my dead body. No, just give it a bit of time, just think about it, it's going to be okay, we've got the legal advice, and, and it's all about trust, right? That fantastic resource of which we have a potentially infinite amount, but we don't mine. And um, <coughs> we built the trust, we did the round, the world didn't end, and then what we decided to do is say, well, if we could code that so that all the confidentialities and privacies and masks were in place and absolutely secure, could we put a small footprint server in every general practice and then wire it up? So we did, and that took us another year. So now we've automated that process I've described to you so that every day, every day, those GP practices can go in and get a statistical likelihood of every one of their patients going in hospital for the next 12 months, which is fantastic, right? It's a whole new world. And I'll show you some of the screens. I can't log in, obviously, because we're outside the network, but I'll show you some of the screens. And the GP practices can see all of their diabetics, but we can only see the diabetics that consented into the program. So all of the protections and all of the controls took us months and months to get through the uh, legal stuff, as you can imagine, and the technical stuff. We had to do full independent assessments for privacy and security, rightly so. And we had to get white hackers in to try and break the system. We had to give them six weeks to try and hack it from the outside. Uh, anyway, it's up, it's up and running now, and we've got it. Uh, we, this is called the ICC, the Integrated Care Connect. And that, for me, is, I think it's the first one. I think it's the first one of its kind. And I don't think Kaiser's got this, actually. This is the beginnings for me of the, because once we can get that infrastructure in with that level of trust, the really exciting thing is that's the beginning of the move to register-based care, because now we can start, so for example, we're now having a conversation with a urologist about men over the age of 75 with raised PSAs who aren't fit for surgery. And so what do we do with that? We don't want to go to a, pay a car park every six months to go to a specialist clinic, it's not. So we can do a call and recall system and, and make sure that the PSA has been done, and then when the levels change, call them into clinic. Uh, same with pharmacy for glaucoma and macular degeneration. There's a whole set of that stuff that for as long as the condition's stable, there's nothing for us to do and we don't need specialists or juniors checking whether it's stable. It's just a waste of time. But we need to know whether it's stable because then, then we intervene as and when necessary. And that's this kind of register-based proactive uh, model enabled by that kind of technology. It's a bit clunky and it's, it's quite expensive. Um, but, uh, but now we're thinking about how can we do that in software, you know, with no servers. And I think there might be a way to do it with some bots. Well, I'll tell you my thoughts, uh, but no, I won't, that's IP. Yeah, I will. So, um, the thought is if you could build a little application that sat inside the GP system with all of the safety, then at like 4 a.m. it could register all the transaction changes from yesterday in the practice, and then, it, and then it could go and look over in the hospital system, and it would have the list of associated patients from the process we've just described, and it could just find out all the status change in the hospital from yesterday as well and then just bring back those status changes to the practice and use that to visualize the status. I think that could be done with a real, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need very good connectivity to that. So when you come in in the morning, it'd just be a double click on an icon and it'll just contain the data of yesterday's transaction changes and re-visualize it, just another dot on the trend that you could click and see the patient ID. Anyway, that's another 12 months work. I've not written that business case yet, I've only just had that idea, but it's a really cool idea. Isn't it? Uh, and, that, and that would mean we wouldn't have to put like, because we've got 180 practices now because our population's growing. Um, we don't, we're not going to put 180 servers. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, I'm running out of time. That's basically saying that a small number of our population cost us an awful lot of money, but we know that, right? And that we need to think about ways to identify them and then do the predictive care. Um, so if we start in this journey, we, we actually... I'm going to move down to the practicals and then I'm going to try and finish quickly. Um, we're actually faced with the problem about how, who, we've got 92,000 patients, who is it who's at higher risk? And from a standing start, that's not, that's not straightforward. Um, we identified about 2,600 of which about 1,800 have actually been into clinic. We've got 1,475 now, as of last week, who are still in our hospitalisation cohort. But some, we don't, we don't do patients in nursing homes. That's a really interesting story. Uh, we spent, I spent that's about $600,000 trying to sort out the nursing home issue, but the incentives and the regulation is so dreadful that we had to, we had to withdraw. That's one of the great sadnesses. So it's an incomplete scheme, this, because it doesn't, ha but it's not, not for want of trying. But again, that's a whole, that's another hour just telling that story. So I'll carry on. This was James's initial algorithm, which once we had the data consolidated, we asked seven questions. Has the patient been in hospital, been to ED? Have they got one of the four big conditions? Have they been more than 20 times to the GP or on you know, more than five medications? 
So kind of a manual algorithm, you had to do something and, and uh, we wanted to learn as we went. And then we generated lists from, on that, the, the doctors literally generated identified lists and literally went out at the lunchtime to the GPs and said, we think from the 160 patients who you see regularly, I know you're in a practice this big, or, uh, but the ones that come back frequently, we think it's these 14 or 15 that are at the highest risk of hospitalisation. And then what we said was, if you want us to take any patients off this, for whatever reason, we'll take them off, because you know them best. And if you, if you think we've missed some, which we're bound to have done, you tell us and we'll add them on. So this is your list that we will act on. And we reckon we got about 60% hit out of that. That first time when we went out to a GP, having done all the data analysis and said, we think it's these patients, that was a real heart-stopping moment. Because if they'd said, who are these people? <laughs> Our strategy would have been bust there and then. Uh, but luckily they didn't. Uh, but it's a bit of a fluttery moment, that. Um, and then there are other ways you can get into the core cohort of hospitalisation risk patients. So we've got about 1.4% of this 92,000 in our sort of a high risk cohort that we, that we know intimately well. And then once you've, once you've identified patients who you think are at high risk, it's an imperfect science, how do you decide uh, whether and to what extent they're at risk? There's 16 things in the literature, and again, we did all this work. Um, none of those will be a surprise to anybody. And so we developed something called a holistic assessment that enabled us to plot for our 1,500 patients, which risk is a high risk for every one of them, and therefore how does their care plan need to be adjusted? So I've got falls risk, I've been to the falls clinic, I've got my aids and adaptations, and I've been seen by the physio. Well, that's now a green or an amber. But I've got a high falls risk on my assessment, and I've done none of those things while I'm a red, and I've got to get those things done, because that's just the basics. And so, uh, so we're, we're opening up a new set of intelligence on the population itself. And then, and then we ran our own, this is what I was talking about before, about being able to put the stat score into every patient. Um, we did this 58 variable logistic regression analysis. I don't know what that means. Um, I do a little bit. I, I do enough to commission it, but not enough to do it. We actually got a firm of commercial mathematicians in to do it for us, because I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't really have known where to start with the latest software stuff. So anyway, we've got these statisticians in. Uh, good company, small to medium-sized company. They came and did a really nice piece of work. And they basically said, of these 58 variables that we can now access because we're looking at GP and hospital data for every patient, which ones are predictive of hospitalizations? And then we did quite a nice thing, which was if we've got five years worth of data, we can, blind, we can build that algorithm and then we can blind it in January 13 and then look at what happened in February actually, in, in hindsight, and say, how, how good was it? And then we got to a sensitivity and specificity uh, analysis, which looks a bit like this. And, the, um, and then we got to a cutoff. I mean, all of this, to some extent, is spurious, but uh, it's certainly 64.4. always makes me laugh, and I always mock. The, uh, there's one of our registrars who's really into all this stuff. And he's convinced, you can see it in his eyes, he's convinced that the number actually is 64.4. And that if you've got a hospitalisation that's higher than that, then we should definitely bring you in. And the older doctor going, yeah, okay, it's a guide, but you know, 64 before, it's spuriously precise, isn't it? So anyway, we took it because we didn't have a better argument. And so if you've got a risk of hospitalisation score of higher than 64.4, then you'll be a candidate for our uh, holistic assessment. But then we need clinical judgment on top of that. So you said 64? 64, right out. <laughs> You're fine. You're going to be good. What, what are the odds? It's actually 0.4%, lower than, yeah, but well, it's just odds, isn't it? Bookies. Um, so this is a quick assessment of the cohort we've actually got. What these curves mean is the, um, that's our uh, overall population, the cohort and uh, the network and HHS ones. So the red line and the green line are the difference between all 92,000 patients and all 550,000 patients who've used our hospital service at least once in the last three years. What's, their, what's the overall likelihood of them being hospitalised? Um, and that's where the peak is, in sort of around the 20% range. The peak for the cohort we actually acquired is around the 50-60% range. So, uh, and, th and these are different ways of showing those numbers. The top right hand one is the uh, at-risk distribution by tens of percent of the people who we actually enlisted into our cohort. So it's significantly moved to the right, which gives us some reassurance that we're doing the right things. Um, and I'll talk, I'll just do a little bit at the end about what we then do with that. So just to fix in your minds, we, we do a lot of work identifying patients. We bring them into clinic. Our nurse navigators work with the GP practices. About 45 minute holistic assessment, which then gets coded into a shared care record, out of which we uh, establish hospitalisation risks and then adjust care plans accordingly. We did that for about a year. I'm just being very honest, right? I do, we did that for about a year and it absolutely knackered us out. The whole team at the end was just like this. 
And, uh, and then we sat there earlier on this year and we said, okay, well now we've got 1500 patients and we know what the risk was at the time of the clinic appointment. What's the risk now? And like, oh, no, now we've got to do a dynamic risk management system because we've got to update the risk so we can actually get alongside the population. And these are the things, anyway, you, you can sit there and go, oh, that's obvious, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah, well, do it first and then come back. Okay, so the disease management. We've got seven things running at the moment on, this is the, this is the move to registers. What would it take to know how many diabetics, who's had a foot check, who's had an eye check? And I know we've done a lot of QI in this space, but, but we, haven't, um, we haven't quite done it with the triangulation of the two types of data. So our concepts of a consolidated list has got, it's basically an a algorithm, four components. In general practices, we know some patients who have got diabetes have got the diabetic code in the place you'd expect it. And some places have got diabetics have got the code, but not in the place you'd expect it, i.e. it's implied somewhere else, uh, a pharmacy record or other things. And some patients who have got diabetes haven't got the code at all, and some patients who've got the code haven't got diabetes at all. And uh, th we get down into relatively small numbers, obviously, <laughs> uh, most of the time. Um, but, but then interestingly, in our hospital services, we've got some patients who get admitted with an ICD-10 for diabetes. Now, how does that get triangulated? And the, we haven't got a business process to do that. It's, it's crazy. And then there are other patients who might be going to an endocrinology clinic every four months, but have never been admitted with an ICD-10 code, so can we bring those in as well? So that's, that was our way of saying, well, could we actually get a view of true prevalence? And, uh, and then can we, could we code it? So this, this, is, this is some early results from that process uh, about the befores and afters. I won't go through that. Sufficient to say these are just the codes for the practices. And these were the actual patients who had at least one code from the seven uh, disease or condition management states in focus. And then this was how those codes moved um, after we'd done the interventions with the practices. And uh, it's, all, it's all very interesting. And actually, again, the way in which we do it is as important as what we do, because all of this is about signaling what we're trying to achieve, developing trust, and developing systematic ways of working together within general practice, hospital and community services to introduce the concept of population risk. And, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's really profound and weird, um, as I said before. And then, and then this is like examples of the number of patients who don't have, um, don't have, any, don't have relevant risk things recorded where you'd want them in the GP system, if you want your GP system to be the foundation of your population risk management system. And it's not that these systems aren't perfectly adequate for all the workarounds that GPs do on a daily basis. It works, right? I ain't broke in that sense. I don't care about that. What I'm interested in is, does the sum total of all of that decision-making and recording add up to the basis of data that we can use to begin differentially applying resources? And the answer is no, not at the outset. We've got more work to do, and, uh, and it's going to take us some while to do it. And then, again, final bullet points. This is just, uh, this is just like, uh, again, many of you won't be surprised, but 148, 175 patients at Praxis A were missing both foot and eye check information where you'd want it to be if you want this to be the basis, blah, blah, blah. So, just going to very quickly show you through. Uh, I, I might finish on time, actually. Um, we did loads of work on our shared care record, trying to make it relevant. It's not great uh, in terms of its uptake and use at the moment, but it is very, very valuable for the coordination centre, having that one point. So, so it operates on a, it's a really smart system, actually, by Extensio. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, if you've got a shared care record in Gold Coast Integrated Care and the GP, and you go and see your GP in one of the network practices, then as your, as your uh, information comes up on the screen at the start of the appointment, a little bubble will come up over the time. And the GP clicks the bubble and gets this. So it's a way to, and so one of the things, when, when we went out to do our needs find at the start, the GP said, if you can do one thing, if you can do one thing, and this was really consistent testimony. They said, can you tell us what's happened with discharge patients before they come in and see me? Because it's just embarrassing. And, and, and they don't know. And I don't know about the pharmacy. And it's just chaos. So, so we, we couldn't, we struggled with that. The electronic discharge summary concept is an idea whose time has not yet quite come 100%. Again, might be working here. Uh, but it wasn't in our gaff uh, two or three years ago. So we've actually got a nurse junior doctor team that does preliminary discharge summaries to the GP spec. So it's just what they were in for, when they came out, any changes to pharmacy, any significant conditions you need to know about. So, and this is the, this is the portal where that's known. So it certainly gets used for that, and that's, uh, and that's been a success. And I'll show you some data that supports that later. This is our journey board. 
uh, anonymised there, obviously, but what, what this is, this is up in our coordination centre. This is patient age, blah, 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 presentation day. This is for patients in the emergency room now, so we can see that from the sort of community clinic. Again, lots of places have got systems a bit like this. Uh, but we can go a bit further than that and look at unscheduled admissions, scheduled admissions, readmissions by practice, which is really interesting. You know? So looking at all this data as it associates with the general practice again is kind of the stepping stones to the type of system we need to build. And then we can begin clicking on the high-risk patients who got admitted, who were they, and how might we intervene. And this is what's used by the nurse navigator team to do the discharge phone calls and various other things. Um, I'll move on from that, I'm running out of time. This is a hospitalisation risk register, hugely excited about this one. Um, so what this does is, uh, this is all of the patients, there's 1,475 of these ultimately, but this is what we've built to inform the weekly multidisciplinary team. So patient X has got a, this is the risk of hospitalisation score that gets auto-populated as I described before. That's your statistical likelihood of being in hospital in the next 12 months. Unscheduled care admissions, we're doing this e-frailty thing, I don't know if anyone's heard about this, but it's a really smart bit of kit that's come out of England and we modified it a little bit. But basically it, it gives us, a, again, it's another sign that there might be something here need looking at. And then we developed our own set of categories, which were hard won within the actual team that works in uh, Southport. Again, led by James and Kate, so that we can know for each of our patients and then refresh this on a weekly basis, what their status is with respect to us. So. We can call up individual patients and see where they're up to. But then we have these categories. Uh, this is just what we're using at the moment. And this is all kind of, you know, in play. End of life, last three months, six months, 12 months, high risk, so high hospital utilised with conditions that are end stage or fragile. And these are patients who are stable. And then we colour code the 1500 and then review them. So if something happens in the week, that will be the topic of conversation in the uh, multidisciplinary team on a weekly basis. And then here's the categories of intervention. So they're in hospital, require high intensity input, so more than two of our services uh, for less than two weeks, subacute maintenance, uh, clinical maintenance, non-clinical and nominal. And if you're nominal, if you're in the bottom of the triangle, that's at the top of the triangle, if you see what I mean, so all these patients are near the top, but within that, the strata, if you want to do dynamic management, just because I've got a high level of risk for being in hospital doesn't mean I'm going off now. So actually you've got to dive into that. It's a bit like those Mandelbrot fractals. As you go into each one, you then open up another new world that needs another set of categories. Anyway, um, so, so this, is, this is the system that we're running at the moment. And it's, it's, really, it's really exciting. This is, it smells like the beginning of the beginning. You know? um, and then for disease management, this is what runs on the servers and the GP practices. These are the screens they see. So if, you, if you're one of our 15 practices, if you're on disease registers, again, these have been co-designed with the clinical teams. This will show you your HBA 1Cs and the ones that are out of range. And then you click on that and it will bring up the list of patients. Obviously, we've taken all the IDs off. And this is the statistical risk of hospitalisation of the patients without a control HBA 1Cs. Now we're, now we're cooking on gas. And these, this information here is about previous util or recent utilisation and then LDL, smoking status, various other things. And these are the kinds of screens that we can see now auto-populated with these risks in. So just the beginnings of a risk surveillance system. So we're just about to set, we just set up an alliance. We had our first board meeting week last Thursday where we're basically saying, right, of all this work we've done, what are we definitely going to do everywhere? And what are we definitely not going to do again? And what's the scope now for taking this thing to scale? So this is the whole... I've heard a lot of people talking here about models of care, so we're just about to do the systematic thing now about how we're going to sort of get it out of the program. These are the papers we've published so far. Uh, again, I'll, I'll send you the, the references are in the slide packs that you can see. Um, we've probably got, I think before, we, by the time we finish next September, we'll probably have another four or five, and then there'll be the full evaluation. We just finished the protocol, we just published the protocol in BMJ Open uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's quite exciting. Um, Oh, I'm going to do two minutes. Um, so the evaluation that we're running is economic health outcomes, patient satisfaction, staff satisfaction. We've got a passive control group of two to one on the intervention, so about 3,000 patients who we've never been in touch with. And we've got an active control group of about one to two, so we've got about 750 patients who, uh, who, who we do baseline quality of life scores and then ring every year. We've got pretty good uh, responses on those. Um, that's that. Uh, where are we up to? Yeah, that's that. We've got about an 80% response rate on the passive controls, which is very, very high. We do, we do a lot of products of work on that. And then we do uh, staff surveys as well. Um, GP staff surveys, obviously, if, if, if the solution we 
bring forward is hated by general practice in a strategy that's designed to have general practice as its foundation. That ain't going to work. So we spend quite a bit of time doing the staff uh, GP feedback. These are the latest uh, staff surveys from late last year. And uh, got some dissatisfaction with the care record. A nurse navigator model is overwhelmingly supported. That's nice. An overall satisfaction of the GPs is 90% satisfied. 10% neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. Nobody dissatisfied. So we'll call that a win. Um, to which the chief would go, yeah, you spent so much money. I'm not surprised. Uh, about six million a year, so it's not it's not cheap. Um, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. This is our um, <laughs> this is one of my medical director's favourite lines, which is why it's in uh, James's. It also reminds me of the senior civil servant in Ireland when I was describing another mad scheme to him, saying this is what we should do, and he sat back and he went, he said. I understand how that could work in practice, but I don't understand how it could work in theory. <laughs> <laughs> he, was a, he was a great fellow. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And then some T.S. Eliot to finish, because T.S. Eliot's great. Uh, sorry about the sexist first word, but it was about 1934 when this was written, so we have to give some contextual uh, apology. So men try to escape the darkness without and within by dreaming of systems so perfect that nobody needs to be good. <laughs> Eliot, was, uh, Eliot was writing about totalitarian regimes and about how we can't perfect human societies through authoritarian rules. And I think it has resonance because actually what we're about, what I think we should be trying to do with integrated care, here's the punchline, is we need, we need to do loads and loads of work on data, but we need to do more work on trust and on the nature of the conversation, on the leadership of the system, such that we can begin to learn about how to introduce the concept of population risk as the dominant idea for resource allocation and professional development. <sighs> Done. Thank you. How do you sell the value of taking an alternative on a different approach? How do you sell that? Uh, so yeah, I've got, a, I've got a bit of experience in this field because uh, that's been one of the things I've been doing for quite a long time. So, hmm, it's a great question though. I think first of all, you've got to get clinical consensus. So that's what I mean about that foot leather thing. So I think if you go with a document, any responsible board or manager will say, well, what do the doctors think and what do the nurses think and what do the allied health think? So I think you've got to answer that question first and take it off the table. And of course, by the time by the time you've answered that question properly, i.e. months and months of repeated conversations, then you've actually generated a bit of a buzz anyway, so that's doing half the work for you. If that's authentic, you know, if it's genuine, if people think you mean it. Brent James, who some of you will know, is another one of my heroes. I spent some time in Intermountain on two or three visits and taken some multidisciplinary teams over there because I think they're great what they do over there. Um, Brent's got this great line where he says, uh, uh, physicians particularly is talking about it says they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and it's a really nice line and I think what he's really speaking to there is saying is it is it an authentic offer because everyone's been led up the hill 20 times and we will continue to be led up the hill if we believe it because it's part of the professional ethos so I think that, that's part one really and I, I, I'm able to honestly say in November 13 I'm honestly I can honestly say to a room of Elder states person GPs, I can say, if you here tell me you don't want us to have a go at this, I'll go and find somewhere else to do. Public health care has got a thousand problems and we can spend our leadership energy solving any one of them. And my kids are at school there, so I'm going to be here anyway, but we could do integrated care. And, um, and, it, and, and so, so basically, I think you've got to give the right of veto, because if you can't get a physician leadership group at a point in time willing then you're not going to have the commitment that you need when it gets hard as it's going to get hard. So it was only after I got both of those groups to my own satisfaction above the line where they were going, all right, because then they'll set you the tests. I, I told you one of them, which is those others won't do it. Well, just OK, let's get everyone in the room and see what you say. And then everyone in the room goes, yeah, I bet you can't get it funded. So, which is almost always true, right? So, so then we set to work formal business case, must have been 130 pages with appendices and references and the inevitable PwC fortune for writing the financial table at the back, etc., etc. So the calculations are fairly standard in terms of here's the number of admissions we get with ICD-10s associated with chronic disease, and if we could deflect 25% of those, blah, 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 blah. 
and then the curve was quite interesting. I can't, no, it doesn't matter. But the, the actual payoff curve, um, if you did it as a profit and loss, assuming you got a nine, assuming a nine million dollar a year budget or something like that, um, you'd lose money in the first year, and in the second year, and the third and the fourth year. And if everything went well, you'd start to break even in the year five, and then you'd cross the return on investment in about year nine or 11, I can't remember exactly when. And it was really cool. And then when actually the first time I saw that, it was a young consultant who did it, who spent a long time with us trying to figure out how we could present this to the board, because our chair, another one of my heroes, which you don't often say, Ian Langdon is a fantastic bloke, but he's got a commercial background. So he's like, okay, I hear the words, and I see the professional excitement, but you've got to show me the numbers. And um, he said, I want to see the profit and loss, 10 years. I was like, oh, really? And uh, anyway, when I saw that, I thought, actually, that's it, isn't it? That is it. It's got to lose, 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 lose. And then if you get it right, you can pull it back. And then if you really get it right and you can suppress utilisation over time with professional agreement and patient consent, then you can start imagining a world of sustainable surpluses. So that was what our business case actually looked like. And then we went to the Queensland Health for the... Uh, we got our Department of Health to fund about 50% of it. So... And again, that took another six months in the nature of these things. So you've got to be prepared to just... But again, there's a 10-year strategy, so it doesn't matter. I don't care if you do it this year or next year. But, but then you can embarrass them and say, oh, my doctors are waiting, you know, what are you going to do? You've got to say yes or no. And in the end, you've got to get it into the Director General's inbox on a memo form because it's been passed through all of the accountants and all the Deputy Director Generals and all the Chief Assistants and the Assistant Chief. And they've all had a go. And if you can get it out the other side and actually on his desk, you stand a chance. So it, it took about a year, I think, and in the end we went, we went up to Charlotte Street and presented to him, and he said, yeah, okay. So that was, that was the story. It's always a version of that. Mm -hmm. Big document, box file, PwC. I'm not affiliated to PwC, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so can, can I ask you to sort of, like, on that role play, how you go about talking to those doctors first time? Like, what do you, what do you take to them? What do you say? How do you open it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually took a crap version of those slides. <laughs> so I th I'd, I'd like a four or five slide presentation. So I'm channeling now about October 13. So when I arrived, I said, right, where? And they said, oh, yeah, well, we've got the GP committee of the Medicare local, as it was then, primary health networks now, and uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's got some of the people we need. So I just went to one of those, October or November, in one of those uh, evening meetings, rubber chicken and an agenda. So I was one of the agenda items and um, did about three or four slides, blah, blah, Kaiser, blah, blah, risk stratification. Do you think there's an... Uh, how, how do you feel about the way services are now, and do you think there might be an appetite for change? And that was pretty much it, probably seven minutes, just, just opening up the conversation. But because I was in their place, it had a different tone about it, and because I didn't have any answers, it had a different tone about it. And my offer to them wasn't, let's solve it like this. My offer to them was, let's start the journey. And if tonight goes well, what I'm then gonna do is start talking to the staff specialists. And, you know, I'll get back to you when I think, when I, think I know. So that was how it started. And then they said, oh, well, you have to talk to so-and-so, and they, and they um, I'll just say one or two other things which are interesting. Big trust moments were getting them to agree to the shared care record and getting that installed on practice systems. And then we took the GP's advice about how to recruit the network and they said write to everybody because otherwise you'll get hinkiness about expressions of interest and procurement and market strangeness. So we did. So, so basically there was a whole set of things where I basically said what would you have us do in this situation and they said that and we just did that. And quite a lot of times, I was working with managers from the hospital and they'd be like, oh, we shouldn't do that. I'm going, no matter. It's what the GPs want, so let's just do it. Dead easy, right? It's easy. But there's a thousand reasons as well we should do it in a different way. Yeah, we don't matter. Because what we've said is we're going to build trust, therefore we're just going to ask them. And when they tell us what to do, we're going to do it. And, that, and that, that's where the determination comes from. Because we said it and we meant it, and now we're going to do it. So whatever you say, we're going to do. And I think if you do that for 18 months, people start to grumpily accept that maybe it's authentic. <laughs> so, yeah. How important was that diagram that you put up, you know, re refocusing the system with the patients in the middle? Yeah. You know, we've seen several versions of that over the years, haven't we? Yeah. Um, Cadbury's got a version. Yeah. The King's Fund's got a version. Yeah. Did that come, was that part of the vision you threw out there? 
Would that come together out of your conversations? Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, the, the, maybe we could say the, strat the strategy is triangular, but the system anatomy is a donut. You could say something like that. Because you're right, they all look like that. Right? These are cliches, aren't they now? The difference is, I think, between those pictures and the real world and whether or not you really mean it. Because, I mean, like I said at the start, I think there's broad agreement on the language of the what. And there's no clue about the, ability, the process of the how. You know, to not to really dig it out. And, and actually, the other interesting thing about that is that people get interested when they hear you asking a hard question and acknowledging that you've no idea how to answer it. And, and I, I, I think, yeah, I think it's fair to say that's, a, that's an approach because you're actually enlisting people in the ability to find the answer. So one of my uh, slogans is that one, one of the right questions is worth 100 wrong answers. And, and, and healthcare policy is full of answers. Everyone's got an answer. Every policy document's got 10 years worth of answers and three year plans of answers and schedules full of answers. Well, they're almost all wrong because it still feels the same. So let's just stick with one or two really hard questions and keep looking at them until we're confident together that we're going to have a go at something. And that, that I think, is a way to pay it off. Don't know. But it ain't quick. No, it's just not quick. It's nice events like this because you put up that three and a half year timeline with hindsight. And it looks quite neat, doesn't it? But of course, we didn't draw it three and a half years ago. <laughs> we drew it last month. <laughs> and there's an infinite number of possible worlds that we explored that didn't make it onto the timeline. So now, and the whole point is, is there sufficient power in the logic to make each twist and turn fit into some kind of narrative that means we're still making progress and we still trust each other? Because the only thing we know is that we don't know. So we have to sort of set off together into a journey where actually there's no... There's no described destination. And actually, I don't think the senior physician groups aren't freaked out by that, if they, if they, if they trust. Well, I hope they do, some days. Then that's OK. It's a reasonable thing to do in a situation of uncertainty. We, we don't want to stay here. That's what we know. We don't want it to carry on feeling like this in another five or ten years. Hmm. Anyway, I'm rambling. Yeah. So what, what components would you keep on with? If I had two million dollars, would it be recurrent or a one-off? <laughs> Important question. It would be for the next 15 years. Two million a year for 15 years, because you have to be careful, because those chief execs will say you've got two million. <laughs> oh no, it's over the whole 15 years. <laughs> Get it written down. Read it. It's easy. Not really. Um, uh, I think I'd set up an engagement and data unit if I had two million. So I think I'd organize, I'd, I'd, go, I'd organize the international evidence because physicians are scientists, senior nurses, nurse practitioners have all done masters most of the time now. So that whole academic thing, that credibility thing is really important. There's lots and lots of evidence. Interestingly, the international evidence is very mixed on whether integrated care works. There's a lot of studies published to say it costs more with dubious outcomes. So there's a lot of, there's more policy enthusiasm than there is evidence for it, which is why I said at the start, it's very good ambiguous. So I think you need to get into that evidence and bring back the things that you think are gonna resonate with your local leadership groups and say, we think, but not only do we wanna do it, we wanna do it because this, and then allow people to test the substructure of the argument. I think that's really quite important. And, and so for example, we had a lot of times, a lot of meetings where we were, oh, Kaiser's is different. And, uh, you know, because they select, which they do. And, um, and Inter Mountain's different because they're all Mormons, which they are. And uh, all these things are true. Yeah, Utah's a very interesting place. I went to Utah. I like a drink. Um, <laughs> as some of you in this room know. And uh, I used to work with Bridget and Trish in a different lifetime. For That's explained some of these references. Um, and I went into the, I went into for dinner one night in Utah and uh, I was getting to the end of my first bottle of beer and, and we ordered another one and they said, yeah, we can't bring it yet. And it's the law in Utah that you're only allowed to have one drink on the table at the same time. So in the small number of places that have got license, you've got to finish your drink, have it taken away and then have your next drink brought. Interesting, isn't it? And, uh, and then some other people say, oh yeah, the good health outcomes because of integrated care in Utah is because they don't drink 
alcohol or coffee, which is true. But one of the emergency department physicians who met me there is a Catholic, and uh, she said, she said, yeah, all of that's true, but they've got the highest rate of prescribed antidepressants in the Western world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that's true, but I, but I want it to be so much because <laughs> we all find a way to medicate. <laughs>